Well, welcome to Artwork, everyone. Uh, so nice to see. Okay, this is really a great uh, response to be here uh, in house with us. Uh, and uh, today, we really, I think, have a, a special program, and we'll be looking at an aspect of art that we normally maybe don't think of or are very much aware of, and that is uh, the role of art in, in, as a process or tool in healing. And art therapy um, over the years has increasingly been um, used and developed as a way of integrating with uh, a holistic approach to health and has been used in many different uh, applications. Um, originally uh, developed, it primarily dealt with psychological uh, disorders of uh, patients. It was found that many of uh, these individuals were withdrawn or inward, um, were not were very reticent or couldn't speak, uh, naturally uh, took to drawing and painting. And in the process, uh, therapists recognized that they could begin to interpret some of the imagery uh, as ways of helping them understand what was going on with these patients and begin to develop a, a dialogue with them. Since then, it's really expanded in almost all aspects of medicine. Um, it's used uh, for patients with serious illness, such as uh, cancer, uh, those with uh, physical uh, or, de um, or developmental disabilities, um, and also uh, during uh, end of life uh, uh, periods to address that. And I should say too that our therapy is really applied to patients of all ages and all different backgrounds. So that's the fact that it's that universal, I think, is an important aspect. And I should say that art therapies, therapists are trained professional clinicians who uh, are found in working in hospitals, uh, in schools, uh, and in private practice and other contexts. So uh, this is uh, the, the therapist is indeed an actual clinician. They have a background typically in art as well as psychology or other related areas. So you hear the term art therapy and it's often used in sort of a general way, but kind of talking here about a, at least part of it is a very serious discipline. We're fortunate to have two individuals with us who I think really bring a wealth of um, experience and background and insight to this. Uh, Gay Walker is a retired professor and coordinator of the Holistic Health and Wellness at uh, Western Michigan University. She's worked as an art therapist in a wide variety of programs and contexts. Again, work with clients of all ages. She has also taught classes in personal expression and is an artist herself. Uh, Dr. Jim Carter is a retired local physician who has had a long interest in holistic uh, approach to medicine. And he's combined that with his love of art, and I think in a really special way. Um, Jim is uh, active, as a, he's a photographer. He's been particularly active here at the KIA where he has not only taken classes, he's worked as a docent, giving tours, he's been a board member. And uh, those of you who have attended Art Break uh, for a while know that he's really uh, presented some fascinating talks, on, uh, including um, the use of art in training uh, doctors and also the uh, various roles in which disease play in the history of art and related areas. So we're delighted to have both of them with us. Uh, so please welcome Gay Walker and Jim Carter. Thank you very much. Very kind introduction. <laughs> Gay and I are just thrilled to be here with you today. This is a topic that both of us are just absolutely passionate about. It's a topic that we had together with each other, just as I've blended this um, background image. It's Gay's a painting on the right and my photograph on the left. And they're both of Vanity and they're both, suns or they're both of Lake Michigan and they're both of uh, sunsets. So just as we blended our talk, we're going to blend our, our knowledge with you. Our talk is both about personal experience, but I'm going to talk a lot about some of the science uh, behind what we're doing. Uh, one of the great resources uh, that I use is called the NIH.gov, which is a, a source of the National Institute of Health, and I'll write this down for you at the end. My first experience with art therapy began 
one as an intern and one as a resident at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. This is the Mayo building. And on, the, on your left is the original Mayo building called the Plummer Building, circa 1928. And on the right was a building that was the Mayo building at that time, 1974. And this is a lithograph by an artist named Ron Hunt. At the lower part of the Mayo building is a 27-foot bronze uh, statue entitled Man of Freedom by Ivan Matrosik. So at the Mayo Clinic, even during our orientation, the very first day, I was this bumbling little intern, frightened out of my wits. Mayo Clinic said, art plays an important role in our healing process. As it turns out, uh, this is a quote now from uh, William Mayo, uh, again, circa 1928. We know all too well the necessity for efficient management, but there is also a spiritual as well as a material aspect to the care of sick patients. William Mayo, 1928. So I would venture to say that the Mayo Clinic was uh, the first uh, of all the uh, health facilities in the country to uh, start to utilize art. Now the Palmer Building on the left, that is kind of in the background, was again built in 1928. It was a unique building for a uh, medical facility. The terracotta tower had 28 bell clarion, or 58 bell uh, clarion. It had bronze doors with ornamental uh, relief. It had frescoes on the inside. It had marble floors. Um, it had polychrome ceiling. It was just really amazing, and it still is. It's a national historical uh, building now. The Mayo Clinic has continued to expand in their art, in their art program. It's, it's impressive and it would rival most smaller museums in the country. It has sculpture by August Rodin. It has paintings by Jacob Lawrence. It has a lot of glassware from Dale Jahuli. Uh, has Andy Warhol prints, uh, Alexander Calder, and really thousands of other uh, works. So let's talk a little bit about stress. And that, that's you know what part of my life is dealing with. And this is actually kind of the background of what we're going to deal with as we talk about our therapy. Stress is defined as the perception that you're facing demands that exceed your ability to cope. To cope. Stress is a wide spectrum, if you will, from mild to severe, but it's also very, very individual. So what is stress to you may not be stress to me. Some stress is good. Stress prepare, for preparing this talk was good for me. It made me focus. Too much stress is distress, and that's bad, and that's what we're going to talk about. Let me give you an example of the wide variety of stress and how it's individual. But my example is of a roller coaster. And if you've ever been on a roller coaster, you know that there's groups of people. There's a group in the front of the roller coaster. Their arms are in the air, and they're waving, and this is the greatest thing since chocolate milk, right? They're really excited. There's a group in the middle that say, well, this is okay, this roller coaster is fun, but, you know, I don't have to do it again. And then I'm in the back, white knuckled, holding on, my eyes are closed, saying, when is this over, when is this over? Same experience, different individual responses to stress. I'm not going to make you physicians, I'm not going to make you neurophysiologists, but you have to know a couple things. You have to know a couple things. The amygdala is a deep process in the brain, and it controls our emotions. The hypothalamus is our command center, and from the hypothalamus, at the top, you see there's a message that goes from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. You've heard of the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is responding to the amygdala, the emotion processing area of the brain. And this response puts out ACTH. So ACTH goes into the bloodstream. And from the bloodstream, it goes to the area around the kidneys. And the ACTH stimulates the adrenal gland. And this happens pretty doggone quickly within within seconds to minutes, if you will. Now, why is this important? Well, you've heard of the fight or flight phenomenon, which is mediated by catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. So the animal part of us says, okay, if we're in trouble, either we need to flee or we'll have to stand our ground and fight. That requires certain things. That requires an increase in blood pressure, which catecholamines do. That requires an increase in blood flow, the brain, the heart, the muscles, that it does. It requires better oxygen carrying capacity, that it does. So stimulating catecholamines is good for some things. Cortisol, that it also stimulates, is good because cortisol causes, causes breakdown 
of uh, glycogen in the liver, the sugar. We need sugar and we need oxygen. That's all we need to flee or to fight. So those are very important things. So the fight or flight response is important. But the problem is, and what art therapy ultimately deals with, is the chronicity of the fight or flight response, the chronicity of high levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine, the chronicity of high uh, cortisol. Now, this slide shows just kind of a, a smorgasbord, if you will, of things that are uh, inter interacting with ACTH and cortisol. But the most important thing is cardiac. And chronic stress, chronic elevation of catecholamines, chronic elevation of cortisol causes cardiac problems. There's absolutely no doubt about this. Causes atherosclerosis, which is heart in the arteries, causes increased blood pressure, causes heart attack, and causes stroke. Those are bad. Those are bad. And that's what we're trying to prevent often when we're dealing with chronic stress. In preparing this talk, is one of the things I just found out just uh, a bit ago. There's some articles now that talk about chronic elevation of cholesterol or cortisol in the bloodstream, and it causes brain atrophy. I've never heard that before, but this is a good referee article. It causes brain atrophy, and what happens in the prefrontal lobe of the brain, it changes your sociability. It changes your ability to have personal interactions. So you know your own experiences, and you know people that have stress, and you know they withdraw. They tend to withdraw from society, they tend to withdraw from friends, and that's, that's really a physiologic response. It's not them just being difficult, that's a real physiologic response. So uh, this is one of the simple things we can do to start combating a stress. And we're going to, you know, stress is a continu continuum. This was given to me by my lovely wife for Christmas, I think, to calm me down or to get me under control. Um, this, is our love, this is our dog, Air, our Airedale dog. And on the surgical cap are my initials and my hospital affiliation. And by my shoulder near the stethoscope is my moniker in the office and my moniker in the hospital. And my moniker was Dr. Doughboy. And the reason I had the Dr. Doughboy moniker is because I would gain weight here and nurses would come by and poke me in the belly, Doughboy, Doughboy, Doughboy. And so I'm Dr. Doughboy. So I, I show this slide to really talk about burnout. And burnout is really a form of continuous and long-term stress. And burnout is not, not just related to physicians. It's all occupations. It's all professions. Uh, before I, as I was preparing the talk uh, a few weeks ago, I just Googled burnout in the educational system. Turns out 44% of all K through 12 employees report burnout and are trying to leave the profession. Of the teachers is 52% are burned out thinking of leaving the profession. So that's just education. Um, I know physicians best, so let me show you some physician numbers, but this is important to you. 42% of physicians experience burnout in 2021. Of that, women are more common than men. Women have a much more complicated life in, in medicine than men. 70% of primary care physicians, of which I was one, report burnout symptoms and are thinking of either leaving the profession or have left the profession. By, 2020, by 2033, it's estimated that we'll be down 150,000 physicians in the United States. And for those of you that have been trying to find a primary care physician in Kalamazoo now, good luck. Right? And this is Kalamazoo. This is a great medical community. Well, why is it even important we talk about burnout besides physicians leaving practice? Well, a burned out doctor is 120% more likely to make an error. More likely. This affects you directly. Burnout, physician burnout costs the healthcare system $4.6 billion per year. And that's not, that's not malpractice. That's just physicians leaving. That's physicians coming back on time. That's the cost of errors. That's the cost of increased testing because of um, physician uh, inactivity or inattention. So the symptoms of burnout are universal to all, all people. These are just physicians, but it's teachers, it's restaurant workers, it's everybody. Loss of motivation and feeling helplessness to that dissatisfaction. The fatigue doesn't get better with rest. You cannot rest enough to take care of fatigue from burnout. Uh, so it's really a detachment, if you will. Somatic symptoms, headaches and, and muscle aches are very common. Gastrointestinal symptoms are common. Change in appetite or 
and, and sleep habits occur, there's withdrawal and isolation. We mentioned that it has to do with cortisol and the procrastination, leaving work early, not showing up for work and so forth. It's important to understand also that in chronic stress situations, there's lower immunity. So we are more likely to get infected if we're in a chronic stress. And that has to do with elevation of your, your cortisol levels. So lower immunity, so getting respiratory illness, getting pneumonia, getting UTIs, all that is increased with chronic burnout. So let's talk about stress reduction. So we want to eliminate that fight or flight response. So we want to lower the, the catecholamines. We want to lower the cholesterol. We want to try and improve the, the physio our own physiology, if you will. But in addition to these you know, physical responses to stress, we want to stimulate certain neurohormones. And again, I'm not going to make you a physiologist, but there's a couple of names you have to know. Endorphins. We want to stimulate endorphins as we eliminate stress. Stimulate endorphins. Endorphins are considered the brain's opiates, if you will. You stimulate endorphins, you make happiness, you make pleasure, and so forth. We want to stimulate dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that goes throughout the brain. And it's the pleasure system of the brain. So it provides a feeling of uh, motivation, it provides enjoyment and happiness. So we want to stimulate these neural hormones. There's a couple other neural hormones I want you to be aware of. One's oxytocin. And I venture to say that there's some in this room that have received oxytocin, because oxytocin, in addition to lowering stress and anxiety, also is a smooth muscle contractor. And so for those of you in labor delivery, you might have received oxytocin to stimulate contractions. But the beauty of oxytocin, this is a little beyond our stress talk, but the beauty of oxytocin is it does improve body, trust, and love. So you think about it in the peripartum period, the postpartum period, how important that is, the animal part of us, the physiological part of us, to stimulate the body and trust and love with a hormone released from the pituitary that goes throughout our entire body. And then serotonin is also a neurotransmitter in the brain. Um, and that helps us stabilize, stabilize our mood, if you will. It gives us a sense of happiness, a sense of well-being. You've heard serotonin because now we have drugs that manipulate serotonin, either a serotonin agonist or a receptor antagonist. So what else can we know about stress? I want to talk about a study that was done at the Mayo Clinic. And this was a study that was actually initiated by a resident. And the resident found that, um, and, and any physician will tell you that, that, that residency is the most stressful time of your entire life. And so this physician uh, basically asked for time off or a leave of absence, which he did. And during that time, uh, he did art projects. He, he was not an artist, but he did some painting. He did some you know, sculpture work. He, uh, got immersed in music, and then he published his study. And what he did after his after his time uh, away on his uh, leave of absence, he came back and he said to the program director, "We have to have a humanities program in the residency program." And so he took the residents group, and at the, well, there are about fifty altogether intro medicine residents. Half of them are control, half of them are study. The study group received a humanities course one hour every other week. And then he measured both objectively and subjectively their stress response and their stress reduction. And even one hour every other week significantly decreased their stress response. And then he did a crossover study. So he took the control group, made it a study group, the study group was a control group, did the same thing. And the results were the same. There was a significant decrease in stress. So now the Mayo Clinic Internal Medicine Program has a one hour humanities program per month. And they have a quarterly wellness program. The quarterly wellness program, uh, the residents do art, they do massage, they do poetry, they do music. They do all kinds of activities for three hours every quarter. And this has really improved the resident performance and the resident satisfaction. This was published a few years ago in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. So this is one of many, many articles that talks about how stress reduction improves performance, particularly in the professions. Let me talk about a, a study that was done in the United Kingdom. 
And this was uh, done in the UK, and it was entitled Visual Arts in Hospitals, Case Study and Review of the Literature. And basically what, what these authors did is they would put different art, pieces of art in the waiting room, in the uh, hospital bed, hospital rooms, in clinics, in chemotherapy rooms, in phlebotomy clinics, and so forth. And they'd measure the happiness or the satisfaction of the residents or of the um, patients and, and the uh, employees. And they found a couple of things that were very interesting. I think intuitively many of you know this, but nature scenes were by far the most popular of all the scenes in the hospital. They were the most common. And as it turns out, it's the reds or the greens and the blues that have a calming effect. And when you look at a color wheel and start measuring people's physiological response to different colors, in fact, it's the greens and the blues that are most common. They found that using abstract art was the least common in terms of even irrespective of color, was the least common, if you will, in the hospital setting. They also found that brightness was important and they found that saturation was important. And so in, in this picture, while draining, it said simplicity is good, saturation is good, and the greens were very soothing. So this would be a, a type of a, a photo, if you will, that they would have in the hospital. So the shorter wavelength, greens and blues, well, this is a more pleasurable and a, a more comforting response, if you will. And simplicity is important. Um, I want to get ready to change it over to uh, Gay and her, her remarks, but this is a legislative belief, brief, 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 if you will, in 2013. So this was given to the Congress. Uh, it was entitled Arts in Health, Strengthening Our Nation's Health Through the Arts. So uh, this is what Congress has actually based a fair amount of funding on for non-medical uh, procedures, supportive art therapy and, and art in the hospitals. So basically, they looked at a wide variety of settings, and Greg mentioned in his introduction that this art is very useful in the hospitals, it's useful in clinics, it's useful in pain clinics, it's useful in chemotherapy clinics, it's useful pretty much anywhere, any medical setting, if you will. And I want to emphasize that the art doesn't have to be just the visual arts. Gay and I are visual art people, so that's what we're talking about. But the music, it turns out, this is interesting, this is for another talk, it turns out that humor, music, and the visual arts all hit the same parts of the brain. So when you do PET scans of people and you tell them a joke, certain parts of the brain light up. You show them something visually, like this scene in Vermont, certain parts of the light, brain light up. And the same with music. So there's tremendous overlap in a lot of the arts. I would add literary arts, I would add performing arts, as we know that they are also very closely related to the visual arts. So arts in all form, the legislative brief said, look, this is really good. Well, how is it good? Well, it decreases the length of stay of hospitals. That's really important. You know, if you've, anybody's been in the hospital recently, you know, we're talking five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a day almost, you know, to be in the hospital. Decreases the length of stay, decreases the money, but the length of stay is decreased because of patient satisfaction. That's important. They're getting better. They feel they're getting better. And you feel, well, yeah, I, I can go home now. I'm ready to go. It decreases the need for multiple medical visits in the outpatient setting. So again, you increase patient satisfaction. That's extremely important in the healthcare setting. Well, we know that creative arts in the healthcare also reduce pain and anxiety. And again, a myriad of studies, one of my favorite studies I've quoted over the years, is the orthopedic clinic study, where people come in after having a joint replacement, and they just measure the amount of pain pills they're taking. And they will use, you know, use creative arts to help them in some other visits, and then measure the reduction of the number of pills that they take. Very simple study, but very real. It reduces stress and improves self-esteem. Most of us, myself included, sometimes when you get in the art or the, in the healthcare uh, milieu, it can be very anxiety producing. 
So there's no doubt that the creative arts decrease that. They reduce healthcare-related infections. Well, we mentioned a few slides ago that, in fact, it's the elevation of cortisol, it's that fight or flight response, it's that chronic stress that decreases your immunity. So by using arts, we can increase your immunity. So we can decrease those, those infection rates, and that's important. We also decrease use of sedation. Again, all of these have been proven and given uh, as part of this legislative brief. Um, arts in healthcare also reduce depression and improve the quality of life. Again, they reduce the situational anxiety in the healthcare setting. The bottom line of this study that was given to the, to the government, an investment in the arts and healthcare is an investment in America's health. I think probably everybody in this room would tend to agree with that. And it's because of that that uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and a number of uh, insurance companies are starting to pay for art and our care, and we hope that they pay for more. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Okay, and she's going to help us uh, talk about art and healing. And she's also going to talk about art as a communi communication tool and in her own experience. Okay. Okay. So, what is art therapy? It's different than art. When we look at art, we're looking for beauty. But art therapy is the merging of psychology and art. So we use both aspects. It's that a picture is worth, worth a thousand words. You can say a lot in a very simple drawing, with, and it doesn't need the words. It's not about technique or talent or skill. Um, I've worked with people um, with Alzheimer's um, people with autism who had no skill or talent, but they really got the benefit of working with the art. And it, it allows us to use creative expression to process. I think that's the big word here, how to process life. And it doesn't have to be the biggest things, it can be the simplest things, but it, it's very useful. Um, these next two slides were done by a friend of mine who had a cystic bladder disease and so um, she was we, we go out to lunch and she was always looking for the bathroom um, she couldn't um, hold her urine for very long and um, so this is a painting she did to describe how it felt so you're looking at pointed um, red arrows and angles a lot of red you see tears you see the dark sky um, you see blood and that was her life um, so she would go to Bronson Hospital every couple of months and they would anesthetize her and um, introduce water to stretch her, um, her bladder. So this is after one of those procedures. Um, you can see the red, um, all those angles are gone. It's softened. The red is now just a tiny little dot and it's surrounded in blue. Jim had talked about blue. Um, I've done a lot of work with color therapy and light blue, sky blue, baby blue, in the presence of that color, your brain excretes 11 tranquilizing hormones. So when I worked for hospice, we often had people, suggested people have blue sheets or blue nightgowns. And um, when I was teaching at Western before exams, I would say, wear something blue. Even if it's underpants, it doesn't matter, you know. So art can tell a story over a period of time, which I find fascinating. These next three were done by a gentleman who, at this point, when he did this painting, he was an artist, but he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And so these next three are um, three years apart. And so in this one, he's describing his life, his world. And what we know sometimes in art therapy, the house um, can represent your body. So he's pretty able, he's still drawing, um, he's still driving, he's you know, fairly normal, but he forgets things. So here his house is, is pretty complete. 
But you look at that tree in the front and it's missing some branches. He knows he's missing some things. So now three years later, um, he's not allowed to drive. They've taken his keys, but look at how small the house is. You see a lot more cut branches, um, limbs that are missing. We also see that this is uh, fall, um, which I think is significant. Um, so this is three years later, and now we have a totally different picture. He, he's not um, very conversational. He's drawn um, the pyramids, which are tombs. He's thinking about death. It's nighttime. He sees the moon. And you see there are no leaves. This is winter. There are no leaves on the trees. If you look carefully, there are faces hidden um, all over in the background. My father-in-law had um, Alzheimer's disease, and he always thought there was someone out to get him. And I think that's what this gentleman um, was talking about. Well, not talking about, but painting about. So he told us how he um, progressed through this illness with, with these paintings. So the thing that I, I think is uh, most important for me is that art therapy makes your emotions visible. We all have emotions, and yes, you can read a face, but wow, can you read a drawing or a painting? Um, for me, it allows me to unload the stress rather than holding it in, which creates more stress. Um, if we can find a way to get the stress out, um, that's, I think, what art therapy does the best. And sometimes um, it points out these things that we didn't know was going on, these unconscious issues. So my first um, art therapy experience was at pediatric oncology here at Bronson Hospital, working with kids with cancer, which I did for quite a while. And uh, this is a drawing, um, well, actually this is not a cancer patient, he has, um, neurofibromatosis. This is a 15-year-old boy who came to a group that I was doing. It was called Attitudinal Healing, and we were at the Fetzer Institute working with kids with chronic and terminal illness and doing art therapy. And so this young man had 53 um, tumors that were um, removed during, you know, by the time I met him. And um, so he was just drawing one day um, in, in our meeting and he drew that tree and the apples coming off the tree are the tumors and they're put on a truck and the truck is taking them away. And what he was concerned about is, well, where do they take them? That's part of my body. Well, when I look at a drawing, I, I try to figure out what catches my attention, what's unusual, what do I want to know more about? And what I wanted to know more about was that body up high with a red um, area in his abdomen. I understood the red, the red legs. He had a lot of pain in his legs. So I asked his mother, is, does he have pain? Does he have tumor activity in his abdomen? She said, no, no. So, you know, I had to be okay with not knowing. But a month later, mom called and she said, we just came from the doctor and he has a tumor right in that area where he drew it. He didn't know, his mother didn't know, but it showed up in the drawing. I, that is amazing to me. Um, years, ago, years ago, I did a study, draw yourself. And I started with three-year-olds and I went all the way up to 93. And all I asked people to do was draw a picture of yourself. Um, and I did it in the schools and in assisted living and everything. Well, again, looking for what catches my attention, this was a first grader and she drew, this is herself. Well, I was disturbed by what looks like a monster with a forked tongue and growling, and she's got her arms up. And I asked the teacher, and I said, so tell me about her. And the teacher said, we don't know much about her. She's very shy and quiet. And I said, this, this bothers me. I think she needs to be seen by the school psychologist. What this turned out to be, that monster was her dad sexually abusing her at home. And she never talked about it. She was afraid. 
So based on the drawing, it was a tip off to get this little girl some help. This is one of my most favorite stories because uh, this was a 12 year old boy with leukemia and his leukemia had come back again, it, 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 um, it returned. But he sat down, he was very serious. He didn't say much, he didn't actually talk very much, but he started by drawing that gun on the left with the yellow, that's God's gun. And God is shooting white blood cells, that, that green thing, he, he made it green so it would stand out. And Satan's gun is the gun on the right and Satan is shooting cancer cells and they're having a duel. So he said, okay, so the score for God in the first round, God gets 140, yes. And Satan only gets 100, so God wins, right? But wait a minute. So the next round, God gets 150, Satan gets 160, so his cancer returned. And he said, but wait a minute, if you add them together, God gets a total of 290, and Satan only gets 260, so God wins. Then he could get to what he wanted to talk about. Am I gonna die? Am I gonna live and I'm, or am I gonna die? And he couldn't just sit down and say that. We had to go through this whole process to, to get to that conversation. Um, this is kind of an unusual, um, a, a small segment of art therapy where they work only with tree drawings. I've only had one course in this, but the idea with a tree drawing and to um, evaluate it is to imagine that the, the bottom of the tree to the top of the tree in a drawing is the age, or it's a measure of the age of the person who did the drawing. So this was done by a 14 year old or 15 year old boy and so then again, looking at what catches my attention is that broken branch and the fire on that broken limb. And so I just started the conversation by saying, what happened when you were about eight? And he said, oh, that's when my parents got, got divorced and my dad left. And he said, how did you know? And I said, the tree told me. Um, there, it's, it's fascinating, you can look at different kinds of canopies and missing um, limbs and holes in tree trunks, um, and it really has a wealth of information. So as an art therapist, um, you know, usually I work with other people. I worked with um, kids with cancer, adults with cancer. I worked in hospice for a while, a lot with people with Alzheimer's. But where it has been most important is for me using it in my own life. Um, so 24 years ago, um, I'm teaching holistic health and I'm diagnosed with breast cancer, which was unbelievable. You know, I'm a healthy person, I eat well, I, I do all the right things and I got cancer. Um, this is a mandala. I, I often and have for years drawn mandalas. Usually they're very abstract. Usually they're, they're very colorful. But this is the first time I put black coming into my colorful life. And this is what it felt like, that cancer um, entering this unexpected um, aspect of my life. This is a, uh, it's not very big, it's a uh, stained glass mosaic, and that's a three-dimensional mask of my face in the middle. But this is a healing symbol for me. So on the blue circle on the left is Western allopathic medicine, um, which I totally agree with and use. The circle on the right, however, is alternative and complementary medicine, and where I choose to be um, in the healing center, it's called a mandorla, that um, almond shaped in the middle, which is done with mirror, um, where it's the, for me, it's the best of both worlds. I'm not gonna throw one out and do only the other one. Um, so this is where I have decided um, my healing resides. So, I was taking, um, this is after the breast cancer, lots of herbs and supplements and vitamins, and I kept saving the bottles. I was gonna do a chest set. Uh, 
And I also took um, a, a pharmaceutical called tamoxifen. Um, so I was going to do the chest set with uh, the vitamin bottles versus the uh, pharmaceutical bottles. But the box of bottles kept growing. And I realized I was putting all of this in my body. So let's show it. So um, my husband drew around my shape. So this is life size. And I, it's called Medicine Woman, Woman. And I filled her with, she's got all the bottles. And I've got tamoxifen bottles in there. There are acupuncture needles. Um, there are all kinds of pins on her hat. Um, cancer sucks, things like that. Um, there are survival ribbons from different race for the cures or different uh, cancer events in the community. And um, a couple of years ago, I took, I have an exhibit of about 37 pieces of cancer art, my cancer art, and I was asked to exhibit it at the Holistic Medical Association in Toronto. And I had to go through customs. And so the customs agent looked at her and said, what's that? And I said, it's a piece of art. And he thought I was struggling, or smuggling drugs in. So I had to take off the caps and prove that they were empty. Um, so this is a very recent piece. So the first cancer was 24 years ago, breast cancer. Then I had um, uterine cancer. And then last year, magically, after I thought I had paid my cancer dues, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer. And um, so the story behind this, and this is the second time I've done this image, it's called the Damocles syndrome. And it's not just people with cancer, but anything that has happened to you um, makes you worry about, well, is it going to happen again? And the story of Damocles was he was at the sumptuous king's feast and he could eat anything he wanted. But the whole time there's a sword hanging over his head, hanging by just a single horse's hair that could drop at any, any point and take him out. And so um, for people who are going through scans and things like that, that Damocles syndrome um, often appears. So I, this isn't even finished yet, but the, in the clouds, I took the, um, the report, my pathology report, and collaged it um, in the clouds. And then the bottom is a Barbie doll that I've wrapped in plaster craft, and I, I cut holes for her, her breast, her uterus, and her kidney. Um, but she's, you know, she's pretty happy, but there is that sword hanging over her head. And I just went through this um, about a week ago, having the first scan in, in about 18 months, a complete scan, and got wonderful results. But boy, that sword was hanging over my head for a couple of days before I got the results. Um, this, this has a couple of stories. Um, the fish is something that is fused glass that I did at the Glass Art Center. Um, there are times when I'm in meditation when animals, often a fish, um, come and maybe bring me messages or comments, things to think about. And so that's why I did the fish. Um, but last year I decided I wanted to do, or two years ago, I wanted to do something a little different. And I took a 3D metal sculpture uh, course here with Paul Nims, who I think I saw earlier. There he is. And so I've never done anything like this before. I go in and for me, painting is the stress reduction. When I start painting, I, everything just melts away and I relax. Well, you go into the sculpture studio here and there's hammering and there's noise and there's sparks flying and it's so noisy and you're wearing a mask and big gloves. and. I remember thinking, oh, this is never going to relax me. Um, and I, I was really resisting this whole idea. But then halfway through the semester, I hit that zone place where it didn't matter. That all went away. And, and I found that place. I'm not continuing to do sculpture, but it was a fascinating experience to have to, to know that I could achieve that. 
So my favorite technique, if I only had one thing um, to use, is, is a bridge drawing. And this can be um, big and drawn out, or it can be done on the back of a napkin at a restaurant. So usually on one side, and actually I'll show you one as I go through it. This is about COVID. This was right at the beginning of COVID. So on one side of the paper, usually the left, you represent what the problem or the diagnosis is. And in this case, you see the, the skull and those are little um, COVID um, particles. And then on the right side, um, you represent what it looks like healing, healed or better. And I was imagining the sun shining again and everything would settle down. The bridge is your support system. I allow myself to use tunnels and bridges and tight ropes, but in this case, it's a staircase. And at this, at this time in my life, it felt like all my support was online, virtual, Zoom, FaceTimes, um, dealing with friendships that way. Um, under the, usually at the bottom of the drawing, you, you draw or indicate what the obstacles are that would stop you from getting across this bridge. Well, there were many. First of all, wearing masks that you all have on today. Um, I was amazed, I, I have a world there crossed out. The whole world is infected at once. Um, the question mark, is it gonna get me? Is this what's gonna end my life? Um, Further on, I've got a dollar sign. I have an Airbnb in my home and I count on the income. And I had to be closed down, thanks um, to Governor um, Whitmer, for six months with no income. And, and it's been fine. Um, but then there was, there's no church, there's no groups, there's no going shopping, um, there's, there's no going to restaurants. So those were the obstacles. Usually I ask people, especially if they're diagnosed with a cancer, to indicate where they are in the process of getting across the bridge today. And I still can't put myself on the staircase as to where I am. But what I'm hoping is that there's a new normal, um, that, that I will have learned some things from this process, that I have learned to slow down um, so that's what this drawing um, has, has talked back to me. But I've done this technique all during my cancer experiences. I've done it anytime something trip me, trips me up in life. This is where I turn first. So um, I retired from Western five and a half years ago. And my husband um, was diagnosed five weeks before and he died three days before my official retirement, which was totally unexpected and um, changed my whole um, idea of retirement. And now I'm a widow. Um, so this is early um, in my process of dealing with cancer. Um, this, this, this is actually a, a very large piece, and I'm not wanting to look at those little wooden caskets to the side. There are 28 caskets um, that I've cut out of wood, and each one has a name. It doesn't have it on there, but I know who is each one. And I figured when I finished this piece that people would stop dying of cancer, which didn't happen. So for a while, I kept cutting out the little wooden caskets and putting them in a basket. Um, but I just had to, um, to somehow describe the survivor guilt. I'm alive, but my friends didn't make it. Um, this is a piece that was coming up to a significant birthday. And the question was, how many more breaths do I have? How many more years? How many more hours? How many more minutes? And this piece actually took about six months to figure out. These things don't just come easily sometimes. And I started collaging time in the back. You can see all the, the paper aspects of time. And then I started collecting clocks. 
And so all the clocks, they were going to be at different times. And then I have watches along part of the, um, the frame. Um, in the middle, you can see there's a candle that's burned at both ends. Um, you can see um, there's a mask of my face with images of me at different aspects of my life. There's a metronome that actually I can wind up and it ticks. Um, and there's an Energizer bunny, bunny. I have been called the Energizer Bunny several times. Um, but when I was doing this, for some reason, I felt that the right side, I kept it blank for the longest time. I didn't know what it needed to be. And one day I found the pocket watch with no hands. And that's when I got it. Okay, that's about the timeless. So it's the finite on the left versus the timeless on the right. And um, those are Scrabble letters. Um, they have everlasting, timeless um, birth and death. Um, actually, this isn't the finished piece. It now has glitter on it and feathers around the edges. But it was my way of, I didn't answer the question, but the question was, um, how much more time do I have? And I, I wasn't looking for an answer, but I needed to process that, that thought. My mom died um, about, let's see, 12 years ago. And um, she was a fabulous artist. And when she was in hospice, um, everything was white. Her white hair, the white sheets, her white skin. And I had this very colorful scarf, a butterfly scarf that had been given to me. And I put that on her. And then I made myself paint her. Um, we didn't have um, a, a traditional memorial service, and I know how important it is to see a body of someone you loved in a casket. So I didn't have that opportunity, but boy, painting her face um, gave me that experience. So when John died um, five and a half years ago, um, he did a form of karate that was based on tiger as, um, as the symbol. And we've studied some shamanism and tiger was his totem animal. And I don't think you can see it, but I have um, a tiger uh, Japanese calligraphy on my arm in his honor. Uh, we lived in Japan for two and a half years, so that's why it's in Japanese. So I painted this tiger not long after John died. And um, on the right of the tiger's face, that's the symbol in the stripes. I don't know if you can quite see it. And his ashes are in the paint. And it was a very important um, um, experience for me to do this. Um, I felt like I was connected to him in, in that way. Um, I've worked some in glass, blowing glass, stained glass, fused glass, and um, some of you may know, know Michael Fortin, who's a glass artist in town. And I went to Michael and I said, can we put ashes in glass? And this was before we really knew you could do it. And Michael said, let's see, let's see. This was at the Glass Art Center. And so I chose the green, um, we met at Michigan State, so that's Michigan State Green. And you're going in and out of the glory hole and building the piece up. And then we put ashes on a, on a table and rolled um, the paperweight in the, um, you know, in the ashes. And then I could take a poker and kind of swirl it around. And it's hot, it's messy. But what it did is it transformed the ashes into an object of beauty. And so I don't have the same feeling now about the ashes um, uh, after making it um, in this way. And I've done a lot of glass beads, um, some here um, with um, family members' ashes in the beads. But I don't want to leave you with all this downer stuff because Art making can be joyful, and, and I, 
that's what it does for me. It, it brings me joy. Um, I told you a little bit about the fish, but during, uh, during COVID, during the lockdown, I actually painted 13 paintings of koi fish. They're beautiful. I've had more fun. I just love playing with the colors. And I got so absorbed in studying the koi fish that that that's that was the joy that came from that. Whoops. Oh, I missed one more. And um, this is a piece that was based on a photograph that my husband took that won um, an award, a number of awards here in Kalamazoo for photography. Um, so this is a piece that right now is at the Carnegie Institute of Arts in Three Rivers in an exhibit called um, How the Light Gets In. And um, what's unusual about this is this is the first time I've ever used colored hot glue. So the texture that you're seeing, um, I did with a hot glue gun with colored glue and then was able to paint on top of it. So I've discovered something new and that's joyful. And even for the fact that this was based on John's photograph um, just made me feel very complete. So I'm hoping this gives you a picture, at least a biased picture from my eyes of a select number of images out of hundreds that I have. It's hard to whittle it down um, into just a small amount, but hopefully this has given you a little bit more of an idea of how um, putting, instead of using words, putting your emotions into um, some kind of art can be very useful as a way of unloading stress and not holding on to it. So thank you. So now we have some time for questions and Jim will repeat the question and we'll do the best we can to answer. Any questions? Oh, please. Comments, oh, please, comments, please. yeah. We don't comment, we don't questions. <laughs> okay, questions. Please. I have two quick, I have two questions. The, the first question is uh, regarding dopamine. And uh, I read that many online things, games, etc., increase the frequency and not the intensity of dopamine released in the brain. And that that is what causes what we call the addiction. But in general, if you're doing something that increases the uh, neurotransmitters that give you pleasure, um, is it more difficult to get pleasure from things that are that evoke your neurotransmitters? The question has to do with dopamine stimulation and dopamine stimulation, irrespective of the cause. So it could be a positive cause, it could be gaining or something. And, and the answer is yes. Same thing. Stimulates dopamine will give you pleasure, and so uh, you're carrying on with the question: Could this um, ultimately lead to addiction? The answer is yes. And, and, and the same with uh, I mentioned that endorphins and, and uh, opiate receptors. In fact, opiates do hit the receptors, the endorphin receptors, and that's why people abuse uh, certain pain medications. Okay. You have two questions? Or? Yeah. Okay. If we want to begin to draw and have someone look at us like you, look at our drawing and see things that we don't see and ask questions and go through the therapeutic process with someone, where do we look for that person? I'm going to repeat the question for them online. The question is if someone draws a piece uh, for their own personal benefit or. or, or even if or start with the therapist. Where does one contact Dave? I'll give you her phone number. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> She's retired. <laughs> 
<laughs> are, are, there, are there therapists around there, that do this? There are few in her, uh, there are not many in Kalamazoo. Um, Brownton Hospital has one um, in pediatrics, I believe. And um, we're starting, an ex we have started an expressive arts program at the Brownson Cancer Center now. And we've done some Zoom meetings and hopefully this fall we're gonna start in-person art therapy. Um, so that's, that will be available to cancer patients who are being um, treated at the cancer center. Good, other questions, yes ma'am. So, talking about two things here. One is there's stress and in a hostile environment, uh, we want to lower stress because people have stress. But in terms of our therapy, in doing it, like what you were saying, Gabe, when you do it, you're putting your stress on the paper. Mm -hmm. What would be the value of us doing that? Okay, the, the question is to do with stress reduction, even not in an in foreign environment like a hospital, but for your own personal benefit, is that? Or on the wall somewhere in public. Or on the, sure, for display of personal benefit. Okay. Well, well, I look at as when I'm doing this kind of art, I'm having a conversation with myself. Um, I don't need somebody else there. Um, and there are certain things, I think a lot of the art that I did when I was first diagnosed, yeah, I could talk to my husband, but I couldn't talk to him all the time. I needed to talk to me and figure things out. And so that's how the art um, became this conversation. I was doing a lot of journaling also, um, writing poetry, um, but trying to get at processing the emotions that I was feeling. And I think um, movement can, can get it out. I mean, a lot, lot of ways um, to get it out. But for me, it's, it's a person. I don't need somebody else. I can, my art can speak back to me and talk to me very carefully. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, does the hospice here offer Question is, does hospice here locally offer art therapy? Ho Did you say hospice? Hospice. Um, I'm not sure right now. Um, I worked for Borges Hospice doing art therapy. And at the time I was there, it was about eight years. I worked with the patients in their homes. Um, and I also worked with the families um, after the person died to kind of process. Um, I'm not aware at this point of, of art therapy in a local hospice. And neither am I. I, I can't answer that question. Any other questions? Right now, um, I lost my husband two months ago, and he was in the center of a hospice. And I'm currently receiving um, grief therapy from them. But um, because I'm an artist, I would like to be able to interact Great art into it. Yeah. Um, we're sorry for your loss. The, the comment was uh, this individual lost her husband and memory father. Sorry for that. Um, and she's using art uh, for herself, uh, but not through, was it through Centra, did you say? Through Centra Care, that's the hospital for right. Southwest Michigan. Southwest Michigan, yeah. yeah. Okay, and I'll be here for more questions. Thank you all very much for attending.